Okay, so a little bit of a genealogy about this whole research program. It started while I was finishing my PhD. The PhD was on informed consent and uh, informatology, so about issues about risk allocation, liability, petitioning principle. And I was struck by this sentence, that, uh, and especially about this sort of asymmetry, because it say it may be unfair to involve bias and confounding to discredit observational studies as a source of negative parts. So I said, OK. The, so the implication is that it's okay to uh, downgrade observational studies for benefits, but not for harms. And I, I had the intuition that this is right, but I couldn't explain it. So I tried to find a way to develop an epistemology around this, uh, around this epistemic <coughs> problem. And I was also struck by this unfair. It's not only mistaken or incorrect, it's also unfair. Hi. And so I wanted to analyze a little bit the structure of this epistemic program, and I came up with uh, uh, a series of reasons for why this is so. And the first is that when we are dealing with uh, uh, risk uh, in pharmacology, we have developed a, a product which has been tested for benefit mainly, of course also for the most common risks, but we discover the other risks in the post-marketing phase. So we have a high, let's say, high default prior for an unspecified risk. We don't know which kinds of side effects that the drug would cause. But we know that there are latent side effects that we don't know about. So there is a high prior. And together with observational evidence or so-called lower level evidence, this high prior could be sometimes enough to trigger uh, countermeasures. And because we are in a situation of discovery, rather than justification to take epistemological uh, categories into account. Uh, the issue is rather of false negatives than uh, false positives. Because, because before we, you, we can taste, test whether a claim about the side effect is right or not, we need to discover it in the first place. And there is a paper which is coming out hopefully in BMJ by Ralph Edwards, the founder of the Absa Monitoring Center for Pharmacovigilance, World Health Organization Center for Pharmacovigilance and other pharmacologists, they are exactly putting up the idea of uh, uh, conceptualizing pharmacovigilance as a form of scientific discovery. And then there are also issues concerning uh, the fact that uh, we don't uh, need certainty about risks because of ethical issues, and this is regulated by the decision rule which has been uh, developed in environmental uh, rules, but also law, but also in uh, pharmacology, especially in Germany, with the uh, Arzneimittel Gesetz, uh, especially with Article 5. Uh, the idea is that uh, uh, we trigger countermeasures to risk as soon as the risk benefit balance is unfavorable enough with respect to the drug. So if you have a painkiller that might cause uh, cancer, you don't need a very high probability associated to the causal link in order to trigger countermeasures. So what we need is something, is a, a methodological tool that allows you to decide on probabilistic grounds, not on categorical grounds. Categorical grounds would be uh, an excessive demand. So because we are dealing with probabilistic hypothesis that whose evidence grows in time, we need an, an instrument that can accumulate evidence in time and update the hypothesis in progress. Okay. And coming back to the time before prior, of course, not only evidence coming from nature is relevant, but also theory or previous knowledge about similar class molecules. And uh, it would be interesting to uh, uh, have a tool that can integrate also this prior in our assessment of the, of the risk. Also, there is uh, an issue of impartiality, which, which has been raised by David Terra, a colleague of ours, and also works a lot in issues of regulation in pharmacology. And <clears throat> he explains the success of randomized controlled trials on grounds of impartiality. What does this mean? He conceptualizes impartiality as a property of a methodological procedure that doesn't allow any of the parties to have an advantage uh, on grounds of uncertainty. So to exploit, the uncertainty uh, and to take advantage uh, of it towards the other parties. 
And because in randomization, the, uh, the researcher doesn't know who, who, whom the treatment is allocated to. They cannot decide to give the treatment, for instance, to the healthier people. Uh, this is a, a tool that, uh, through double blinding, this, uh, together with randomization, of course, uh, this allows the procedure to be impartial in some sense. However, concerning harm, requiring randomized control trials to test harm would be exactly a procedure that goes against the purpose of the reason for which these kind of evidence standards have been developed. Because in this case, then the pharmaceutical agency can exploit the uncertainty and say, until we don't have an RCD, then there's no causality. Uh, of course, things are much more nuanced now, but the Coltergan case in Germany uh, rose exactly out of the fact that at that, at that time, the provision principle was not still in place, and uh, exactly the Coltergan trial says, when there is some suspicion, when ground suspicion, then the risk should be shouldered by the pharmaceutical industry, not by the patients. That was the push point, let's say the origin of the professional principle within the pharmaceutical uh, environment. Okay, and what does this impartiality thing tell us? It tells us also that we are dealing with strategic behavior. So evidence in pharmacology is embedded in a very complex framework where uncertainty can be exploited, but not only epistemic uncertainty, also risk in the sense of expected loss. So everyone knows that these sick people are fragile and weak. And so sickness can be exploited by people that have had vested interests together with uncertainty to, uh, for their own purposes. So the idea is to uh, analyze uh, the display of evidence and the production of evidence, evaluation of evidence, with these kinds of dimensions in mind. We are uh, <coughs> publishing a, 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 a volume uh, with Adam Lacaz on this, and possibly also then a handbook called Philosophy of Pharmacology, where we want to have this kind of overview over the field. Okay, so because of these dimensions that I talked to you about, uh, I try to characterize medicine and pharmacology along these dimensions that should jointly uh, mm, inform medicine with respect to other scientific disciplines like physics or biology or whatever. So medical uh, products are so-called credence products. That is products for which the consumer, medical community, patients, and public health system in a more general sense cannot evaluate the quality prior and not and often, often not even after consumption. So there is a strong information asymmetry. And it's a cascade of information asymmetry because the patient knows almost nothing doctor a little bit more, the pharmaceutical industry a little bit more, but nature knows best. <laughs> and the pharmaceutical industry not even knows everything. Then, uh, uh, medical decisions are intertwined with pressing ethical dilemmas. And the interesting thing is that generally in, in the law or in ethics generally, we have two contending goods, a dilemma between two contending goods, but here generally it's the same good. Whether you take the drug or you don't take it, it's always health which is at stake, and then the consequences of your decision, of course. And then, sorry, I'm uh, And there are both high stakes in terms of physical, psychological, existential, financial costs, both at the individual and collective level. And producers of medical knowledge often have less interest, of course, it's totally rational. <laughs> and uh, so, they didn't have to engage in strategic behavior, which obviously exploits uh, all the above and whose futures may also evolve in time. So Bennett has worked a lot in this. Okay. So there have been some, uh, I don't know where, oh, okay. so this is, okay. Uh, institutional instruments have been developed against this kind of challenges, and these are presidential standards. But as I was mentioning before, sometimes these evidential standards go exactly against their purposes, because they may be either too rigid or they may, they may be uh, are overcome by strategic behavior by the pharmaceutical industry or whatever other stakeholders. And decision rules like, like the professional principles, deontological norms. Uh, but um, recently, uh, I mean, yeah, scientists, statisticians, Andrew Gellman, other people working in methodology, especially psychological methodology, is stimulated by this reproducibility crisis, so called reproducibility crisis have advocated for a more comprehensive view of evidence. 
And I think that here is exactly where epistemology can help a lot. Because uh, in medical methodology, it's as if the, the methodology and all the sophistication around uh, uh, adjusting for profile, all the te technique, uh, statistical techniques that have been developed in time have been developed in the, uh, within the path of frequency statistics. Because it's also the easiest way uh, to do statistics, of course, and for medical doctors that don't have the time to be statisticians, they are doctors, it's the easiest way to analyze evidence. Because of this, however, the view on uh, evidence has been restricted by the foundational aspects underpinning uh, frequency statistics, which is a hypothetical adaptive method, and where you have uh, a strong uh, reliant, a strong emphasis on random error, and so calculating random error in the long run. And uh, yeah, this so-called data uh, statistician, and you get one, I would say, is not a dogmatic base. He also uh, advocates for a reconciliation of frequentism and Bayesianism, but he advocates for a broader view on evidence that takes also into account uh, higher order evidence, such as evidence about evidence, or evidence of, or knowledge about evidence, knowledge about the procedures that you, we use, and to track them and take them into account in your calculation of the hypothesis, uh, the confirmation of the hypothesis. So I'm presenting here our research program. I worked uh, on it together with Jürgen, who's here, Jürgen Landes, Ron Kölliger, who's no longer here because he, he has got the permanent position, uh, likely, uh, and Stefano Bonzio, uh, who's working in Italy, and other people uh, pretty soon. Okay. So we wanted to develop a research program where different issues are investigated in their joint interaction. I must say, until now, it has been rather problem-solving project. We try to develop this framework in order to help drug agencies to do the solution, uh, to do their, their assessment. Possibly we develop also software. But then there is also more epistemological part, more philosophical part. I hope to be able to present both here, but we'll see. Uh, yeah, the idea is also to distinguish between first and second order evidence, uh, in particular to classes of pharmacology. And other medical questions, such as the nice of random error versus bias, or the BDC price, and so on and so forth. I hope to have the time to present everything. Let's see. Okay. So, the general idea, the big picture, is to have a methodological R evolution. <laughs> it's an R for reliability, replication, all these kind of things, robustness, and so on. So, there is the classical focus on the evidential support on the hypothesis, which is the focus of philosophy of science, based in epistemology, formal epistemology, but also statistics, more generally. Uh, but also this, let's say, many potential dimensions, such as reliability, relevance, dependency structure of the different items of evidence in a body of evidence, and coherence and consistency of these items of evidence within themselves and with respect to the hypothesis. And this picture uh, can then incorporate possibly dimensions coming from social epistemology, such as national incident, reputation, regulatory constraints, and so on and so forth. So this is, a, I want to put the pictures of to, uh, to guide the reading of the next slides. And the motivation is, uh, I mean, general, sorry, uh, to attenuate cross-talk between statistical schools and methodological positions. Sometimes it's a is the value better than base factors and so on and so forth. Okay, this is uh, all good, but uh, in some sense one uh, doesn't realize sometimes that it's just about random error uh, or yeah, about calculating uh, the reliability in only that sense of accuracy, but uh, one should sometimes uh, epistemology or formal epistemology can provide a bigger picture where you can locate your, your, your discussion and possibly deflate it. In particular, we have quite specific debates, the EBM debate in medicine, reproducing parties, bias in research. Okay, so we would like to develop a formal epistemology of medicine and use formal epistemology as a lingua franca where insights coming from scientific methodology, philosophy of science, social epistemology, conditions of statistics can jointly contribute to explaining methodological dissent and possibly solve it. Okay, so the outline of the talk is of the what I'm talking is, uh, okay, some notions about EBM versus e-synthesis. E-synthesis is the name that we gave to our framework, uh, e for evidence, uh, and, and, but also we're trying to develop this kind of software so possibly uh, uh, 
this also mentioned this. Uh, the reproducibility crisis is an example of these um, issues in medical epistemology that are challenging. Then uh, a, a game that we played together with Jurgen. We have a framework. We try to see whether our uh, framework can formalize the relationship between random uh, error versus bias uh, in hypothesis uh, uh, confirmation. And then uh, Okay, so. So the general idea is that um, by being based on fragmented uh, statistics, uh, the EBM approach, the evidence-based medicine approach, relies on the probability of error in the long run. So being a categorical approach, there's a greater reductive risk. So you have to control for this error, uh, and you have to minimize this error. Uh, the broader approach, uh, Bayesian approach, uh, relies on probabilistic uh, associated with direct and hypothesis, and so takes into account the feasible inference and also all the available evidence. Also higher order evidence that is about the evidence. Okay, it's not that they don't take into account this because there are, I don't know, um, methods to track publication bias and so on, but it's more modular and it's as if each kind of information uh, either upgrades or downgrades the evidence uh, that you have. But Sometimes if you have, I don't know, a low p-value, but then you have a suspicion of publication bias, and so at some point you don't know what to decide. It's really undecided uh, about the hypothesis. Can it happen also in that sense, but here you can at least track these dimensions and com compute them together. Okay. No. Okay. So, um, let's take it up at random error. Measurement errors produced by chance effects are due to contingent factors which vary from measurement to measurement rather than from population to population. And repeated measurements are able to correct such errors through averaging. So some statistical techniques establish a probability of tolerable random error beforehand and use such threshold as a decision tool for accepting or rejecting the hypothesis under investigation. So the point is that given that you have, you have this, this threshold that is categorical, then you have a great inductive risk. Because you decide that with one slot um, experiment, in principle, whether to accept or reject process. So the focus is really on reliability of the, instru of the instrument. And reliabilities are not only about the uh, random error in the long run, but also, of course, about systematic error, which is not related to uh, the sample size, for instance. You can, so this is uh, the classical formalization of. Uh, of three shots in uh, Niemannite uh, experiments where you decide in advance what kind of, where to put the three for accepting or rejecting the hypothesis, and then you have a false positives and false negatives depending on this three shot. And you can have a trade off and decide beforehand what kind of risk you want to accept for false positives and false negatives, respectively. And this kind of three shot, uh, of course, depends a lot, uh, I mean, the result then depends a lot also on the sample size. Instead, systematic error uh, does not depend on the sample size because it's about the structure of your experiment and whether so, some other factors explain your effect size other than the one that you're investigating. And so, generally, randomization and blinding are used to have a guarantee that the effect size that you see is due to the treatment that you're using in the experiment and only to the treatment. Okay. These two things explain evidence hierarchies. So the EBM approach is an approach that tries to maximize internal validity, so to minimize uh, random error and confounding. Uh, we have ra ra random versus non-random sampling, which is different from randomization, represent uh, which should guarantee representativeness of the sample population with respect to sample population, experimental versus observational design, it's about isolating your treatment with respect to other possible confounders. And control versus uncontrolled design. So if you look at the evidence hierarchies, they put uncontrolled uh, evidence at the lowest level, then controlled but not experimental, then experimental, and then meta-analysis, and systematic views of meta-analysis. And these are the criteria behind this hierarchy. Okay, so the idea is that controls have the purpose of verifying causal relevance, 
intervention in terms of testing cause of sufficiency, and random sampling is a way to establish cause and necessity of any, any, any given cause of in a specific cause of set context. So here we come to uh, relevance and context sensitivity. Because if you, uh, the point is that what you assume when you also in cause of graph search, uh, you assume that you isolate your cause with respect to the fact in a specific cause of set. But you're not sure about whether there are latent variables there. So in some sense, you are sure about something, but there is uncertainty about uh, the latent variable, variables that you might not have uh, taken into account. Randomization relatively solves this, but, there are, but not everybody agrees with that, especially in Zebra Threat, and that's where I come to now. So, statistical medical evidence is first and foremost noisy. Noise is not about error, but rather about the opacity generated by the irreducible context sensitivity of causes in the medical media. And now I'm quoting Hanin in a recent study. Uh, Hanin makes this point very vividly while explaining the irreproducibility of trial results through sources of uncontrollable variation in clinical research. Okay, so here's the quote. It's about metastasis or an answer. Uh, whether or not the metastasis will escape from dormancy in a particular patient depends not only on the effects of treatment, functioning of the immune system, uh, concentrations of cyclotic angiogenesis, promoters and inhibitors, and other internal factors. Exacerbation of the disease may also be triggered by intercurrent sporadic external events such as surgery unrelated to breast cancer, infection, trauma, radiation, stress. Another highly significant prognostic factor is the intrinsic aggressiveness of the disease. However, its reliable assessment at early stages of the disease has proven to be fair, fair, far in this story. Thus, the most critical determinants of the trial outcome are largely unobservable and poor unpredictable. And then he goes on. Sorry. Uh, I back. In practice, the above observational and prognostic factors are substituted with less informative observable sur surveys, such as age at trial entry, stage in the surrogate rate of the disease at surgery, localization and size of the current tumor, whether or not the tumor may be the surrounding tissues, the extent of normal involvement, menopausal status, estrogen and progesterone receptor status, presence of specific mutations, family history of breast cancer, individual history of other cancer. Even this rough and incomplete set of surrogate clinical variables creates a large number of categories of women in both arms of the trial, with potentially very different characteristics of survival. Importantly, randomization won't eliminate the observable and hidden heterogeneity. It will only reduce the difference in the extent of heterogeneity between treatment and control arms. The aforementioned intersubject heterogeneity is quite typical of clinical trials, as opposed to in vitro experiments with cell lines or studies in animal models. <coughs> Thus, individual responsible subjects in both arms of a trial cannot even approximately be viewed as homogeneous, let alone distributionally identical. Okay, and and Cigatrit exactly uh, goes along this line, or what well, Ogawa came first, <laughs> came first, and uh, she speaks. I mean, she grounds her criticism of RCTs as, as both standard in medicine, but also in economics, uh, on grounds that of this context sensitivity of position, intrinsic context sensitivity. And this uh, is done also by recording the INUS, um, in, by drawing on uh, the conception of course, this is INUS conditions. So, an INUS condition for, if A is an INUS condition of, for E, means that A is part of at least one conjunctive set standing in a deconditional relation with E. So it's, a and B and C uh, in case E, or A and D and F, or E and D and F. So, if this is if this holds, then in a study which investigates the causal effect of A with respect to E, the effect size would be the result of the proportion of people having also the characteristics E and C or D and F over all the other subjects. The, the other subjects would be, for instance, A, C, F, A, B, F, A, C, D, or A, B, D, which are not sufficient for this for E. Non-determinism of A with respect to E is also due to cases where, notwithstanding the aims of the absence of A, E will nevertheless occur. That is, when subjects present with the characteristics B, D, F, John, this guy is here. Okay, so if one would assume a causal law underpinning the data, then the set of vectors that modulate the causal effect of, for instance, X and Y, would be represented by its coefficient beta here. And beta for, uh, let's see, 
is a conjunction of vectors, a function of vectors. So that we can have age, genetic makeup, and so on and so forth, the things that we said we, we saw with Hani. The point is that we are not aware of them. We are not aware of all of them. So we may also adjust on the uh, false, uh, on false um, biomarkers or covariates. Okay, or well, we don't, we may not know and not adjust for that. So as noise can be tracked and possibly reduced where? Sufficient for the cells can be identified and pulled apart through subgroup analysis, sorry, through subgroup analysis, adjustment, specific study design, random effects analysis, and the analysis. Also, because the search for the analysis of promised independence and independence belongs to the instruments that may immediately take side of the black box. However, one should be aware that in any case, the information provided is that of causal ordering in a sufficient post set. If it is sufficient, Hence, high order and this I order and say about whether the causal set is sufficient arises here. So rather than reducing noise, such techniques must assume its absence in some sense. So we have to be aware of this. Okay, we are just so we should reduce noise, but who knows whether we got the right arrivals, whether there are hidden wires which are more important, or even whether we adjust on colliders, so we create dependencies that are not there, this kind of thing. So here we come back to our framework. In our framework, we want to have the hypothesis growing together with evidence also about these things, also about relevance, context sensitivity, and reliability. And I'll show you how. So the idea is that we have uh, an epistemic net. This is not a causal net, it's an epistemic net, where there is the hypothesis of causation. These are abstract consequences of the hypothesis of causation, like uh, those response, probabilistic dependence, mechanism, time, and so on. And these are the reports, the concrete dirty data. I know, a report about NACD, a report about the epidemiological study, and so on. And there is a, a reliability note attached to it. There are also relevance notes, but for the moment, what is interesting is this the hypothesis of causation grows with accumulating evidence. Uh, this is a hypothesis of causation in a given model for a given population. Mm. Model M, population U, this is paracetamol causing asthma, for instance. Now, the idea is that, for instance, when you get a clinical case, an individual clinical case from a doctor that gave a drug to uh, a patient, what kind of evidence is this? It's just one person. It's an N of people one mm. trial. But it's a very specific information because uh, generally when you give a causal judgment about these cases, you have challenge, pre-challenge, re-challenge. So the, the patient has taken the drug, then to verify the thing, the, the doctor uh, removes the drug, let's say, then sees whether the symptom goes away, and then he gives the drug again, and then sees whether the symptom comes back, and so on. And then there is also the clinical history, and, and, and so on and so forth. So here we have really strong information about causation, but on an individual. And we say it's a, uh, information about difference making, which is a perfect individual of causation, but uh, in a, a specific individual. What does this mean here? This means that we have an infinitely specific reference class. And we, uh, so this reference class, in some sense, it's uh, uh, very, 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 very big. Because we don't know whether it's the fact that it is a man or a woman or its age that makes the, 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 the relevance of causation uh, important. So uh, uh, we have, let's say, a reference class which is infinitely specific. However, then we get another clinical case. And there, there, is a, there are similarities between one case and the other. So we can start to specify a little bit the reference class without vaguely. Then we have many, many, and we start to have a, some sort of probabilistic dependence at the population level with this kind of population in mind. We might then do epidemiological studies and then discover that, okay, this happens in women but not in men. So the idea is that the uh, causal set, the relevant causal set, sufficient causal set, uh, grows with the evidence. So it's also induced by the evidence that you receive. Another advantage of this framework is that we distinguish between different levels of evidence. So here, okay, here's the report, and here the causal indicator. So the causal indicator is something abstract, like those response. 
But the data can be, I mean, the data points that you have there, in reality, they can be very dirty, they can be very imperfect. So. And, uh, and then there, are, there is a really big irrelevance node. Well, we, we are developing these in our other paper, but mainly the idea is that relevance capture exactly external context sensitivity, so external validity, and reality is more about internal validity. Random error goes directly here. Okay, and this is the entire framework. It's interesting because it, it's not an alternative to EBM. It captures the intuitions of EBM, but tries also to uh, incorporate the intuitions of other philosophers that criticize EBM. For instance, the EBM Plus program by John Williamson, Federico Augusto, Felix Hilary, in Canterbury. They advocate for using EBMs, the hierarchies, plus mechanisms. The difference is here that we don't only have, uh, well, let's, let's explain this <laughs> before. <laughs> okay. So here we have the hypothesis of position. I told you it grows, it's a hypothesis uh, position in a given population for a given model. And here are the indicators. It's not an exhaustive list, so here we have dots. So here's difference making, idea of difference making. So the asymmetric relationship of cause making a difference to the effect and not the reverse. And here instead we have symmetric statistical relationships, such as probabilistic dependence, those response, rate of growth. These are symmetric. You don't know whether x causes y, x, uh, I mean, probabilistic dependence goes both ways, and also those response can go both ways, can be interpreted both ways. Here is the abstract uh, proposition that it exists a mechanism. There is a mechanism that underpins this position. Then we don't know which, which ones, of course. Sorry, I'm talking too much. Okay, and here's uh, time precedence. Okay, then we get records that feed into these indicators, <coughs> depending on the kind of study that you have. A cohort study, for instance, can tell you something about one of these or more of these indicators, generally one of the, the most important or this one. And if it's a longitudinal study, it can be, for instance, this. And time. So cohort study gives you information about time precedence and this. A randomized control trial fits here, so in difference making, because of the intervention. And all interventional studies, all experiments, give you information about this asymmetric relationship. Okay. Now, uh, EBM Plus advocates for using this kind of information plus mechanism. So the idea is that if you have this kind of information or even this plus mechanism, then you can then you can claim causation. So it's categorical first of all, and it uh, sets the necessary and sufficient condition for causation. We are more flexible, let's say uh, more modest. We just advocate for probabilistic assessment of causation. So there are no uh, sufficient or necessary conditions that are just indicators in the line of broad criteria guidelines for causation. And one can also see that, for instance, uh, this means that uh, for them, these two are sufficient for causation, whereas the EBM, the classical EBM approach, lies a lot of important on, importance on this line of evidence. So RCT is feeding in difference making, in causation, whereas it downgrades all the other kinds of evidence. What we do is, uh, for instance, a record about the probabilistic association, even if there's no uh, intervention, it's not experimental, but it's well done, then it can uh, in, uh, greatly contribute to any of these statistical uh, indicators. Evidence is downgraded here at this level because this kind of indicator do not, uh, let's say, do not support causation to the same extent that difference making does. Difference making is a much stronger indicator. So it's as if yeah, we are incorporating the intuitions underpinning EBM plus EBM and other philosophers here. And also the issue about relevance, context sensitivity, because uh, evidence is also downgraded really or upgraded depending on uh, how much you consider that the sample of this study is representative of your target. So now, uh, how much time do I have? No. Ten more. Ten minutes. Would you like? Yeah, no, but it's too much. No, to, to deal for what I have, I have too much. Um, so, no.
So I skipped a little, I mean, I, mean, I skipped a little bit the European disability crisis. There is a very interesting study that I would like, I suggest you to read. <laughs> it's about the Bayesian modeling, uh, leveraging model analysis of the European disability crisis. That in the end uh, tells you, okay, if you take into account <coughs> publication bias, which is a sort of symmetric bias, uh, and the random error, then you deflate the reproducibility problem. I wanted just to mention this as an issue, and well, I'm sorry, but I can to skip it because it's not. And okay, yeah. So I go to our analysis of uh, random error and bias. Uh, so one direction for statistical analysis that appears to me this is Eddie uh, Gelman, sorry, it's not me. Um, <coughs> is based on inference an approach in which uh, data combined with prior information, in this case the prior expectation that newly studied effects tend to be small, which leads us to downwardly adjust the other estimated effects in light of the high probability that they, they could come, become larger from noise. So this is, again, uh, a sort of uh, uh, confirmation from Andrew Gellman that we are going a little bit in the same direction of how, of how this is done by classical uh, hard based non analysis. And you say, but these steps will not be easy because they move away from the usual statistical pattern in which each scientific study stands alone. To resolve the replication process in science, we may need to consider each individual study in the context of an implicit meta-analysis. And not meta-analysis in the cochrane sense of um, data pooling, but this kind of meta-analysis, putting different kinds of evidence, uh, all, the, all possible evidence of all, all kinds together. So <clears throat> I want to present our little game with, uh, that we did with Jürgen. It's about uh, using this kind of framework also to analyze, analyzing uh, the effect of random error and bias on the hypothesis confirmation. And this also tries to analyze whether, uh, var since our framework in some sense also comes from the idea that uh, the more variety of evidence, the better, and so on and so forth, this is also a response to a, a challenge to the variety of evidence thesis in uh, epistemology. So these are quotations. Concerning the variety of evidence thesis, I like this one uh, a lot. <laughs> Any working scientist is more impressed with two replications in each of six highly similar experimental contexts than he is with 12 replications of the same experiment. And uh, we draw from Bowens and Hartman the same kind of graph. What differentiates us from them is that they uh, formalize unreliability in such a way that uh, the unreliable instrument is a randomizer. But in what sense? Okay, if it is reliable, then it is fully reliable. It, the probability of obtaining a report from is, this instrument, given that the consequence of the hypothesis holds and this one is reliable, it's one. The probability of obtaining a report, given that the consequence doesn't hold and this one is reliable, it's zero. So perfect reliability if the instrument is reliable. If it is not reliable, here, then you have the equal probability of obtaining the record, whether the consequence holds or not. Uh, however, the point is that uh, this A can vary. So it's not a proper randomizer. If A is 0.5, then it is a real randomizer. But if, it, if A is higher than 0.5, it is a yes man. That's yes, whatever. And if it is lower than 0.5, it is a naysayer. So the, uh, the consequence is that, okay, if the, if the instrument is unreliable, so if unreal, let's say, then if A is higher than 0.5, it is a yes man. If A is lower than 0.5, then it is an A say yes. And in the end, we conclude that all results of violation of that, rather than of evidence thesis, in page of this, because the idea is that if you obtain consistent records from the same instrument, which is less variety of it, and the instrument is a yes man, then consistency tells you mm, this is a yes man because it comes. I mean, it increases the probability that the instrument is unreliable because you don't know whether it's, you know these kinds of probabilities, but you don't know whether it's unreliable or not. So you see two records from the same instruments, 
And if it is unreliable, then it is a yes man. So this is this increases the probability that the instrument is unreliable. Instead, if you receive two positive records from an instrument which, if it is an unreliable, is a naysayer, and they're both positive, then you say, okay, but this is not then unreliable, it is reliable. And so in their uh, model, uh, there are cases where uh, the variety, variety of evidence thesis fails because you prefer to get the two records from, I mean, it's more confirmatory right, to get the two records from the same instrument. In that, having them from the same instrument, if you know that the, if it is unreliable, is a non uh, an naysayer, then it says, oh, okay, it's reliable. So all the dynamics, the epistemic dynamics, in both how can rely on this. I repeat this in the slides, so most of the by body uh, was used as a randomizer and a randomizer of a particular kind. If A is 0.5, then our unreliable instrument is a proper randomizer. E instead, if A is lower than 0.5, the instrument tends to be a naysayer. Consistency of positive records from the same instrument boosts the belief in the instrument not being such, not being unreliable, and therefore, it is being reliable. And so these are, these are the phase space for these uh, settings. These are the settings. These are. Uh, this is less variety evidence and more variety evidence. Why? Because here we have two records concerning the consequence from the same instrument. When uh, I mean, what has happened? Model same instrument uh, by uh, having the records from the same instrument by having them share the same reliability in order. Here we have two instruments, so each one of the records has his own reliability. Here is just one record, here is two records from the same instrument, and here is the same, but we have two consequences. One tested two times from the same instrument, and one tested from different instruments. But the general gist is that all these results of um, violation of the variety of evidence is relying on this uh, uh, modeling of unreliability as a randomizer. Okay, so I should stop here, maybe. <laughs> No, what we obtained is that is a different thing because we try to model. I'm sorry, not have it, not have it right, okay. To model random error and, and bias in this way. So we have we don't have a perfectly reliable instrument and a perfect random, a randomizer, let's say, but we have instruments that are either reliable but imperfect ones, so they have random error, and this is this is the probability of getting a positive report. 1 minus epsilon, and the probability of getting a uh, uh, false uh, positive record, so epsilon. And here, sorry, and here is a biased instrument which shifts to the right, positively biased. So that uh, there is a higher probability of getting a positive record, a true positive, but also a higher probability of getting a false positive. So this modeling leads to to the different uh, to the different phase space, and the important thing is the this so that the bad phase when <coughs> the false to true positive ratio of the unreliable the bias instrument is lower than the false to true positive ratio of the reliable instrument, and what does this mean? This means that when the instrument is biased, but in some sense more precise, then you prefer evidence from this than from this, because here the instrument is unbiased but it's noisy. Okay, so this is the new phase space. So we have that uh, the vet codes, and if we zoom in in relevant, let's say the relevant space, because here we have <coughs> a gamma error of 0.1. <coughs> We see that uh, the left holds almost all the time here, and here it fades. <coughs> so it fades exactly when gamma and epsilon tends to be equal. <coughs> I don't explain this. So that then fades with decreasing gamma, <coughs> decreasing false positive rate of biased instrument, and with increasing epsilon and error, and the R, a true positive rate of biased instrument. So replication is found when the reliable instrument is noisy. 
Okay. So, conclusion and outlook for my epistemology can provide a higher order of normative perspective on methodological issues, <coughs> such as replication, BIA, bias, which allows to track the interplay of various dimensions of evidence, coherence, strata structure among themselves and do the characteristics of measuring is strong reliability, dependence of measurements, and so on. Furthermore, it can incorporate meta evidential considerations such as trustworthiness of the source as a function of possibly conflict of interest or other features. I stop it here. Thank you.